Hello, I'm Jen Moore, Music of the Baroque's program annotator, and I'm so pleased that you've joined me for Baroque Notes, our series of pre-concert talks. In this installment, I'll be discussing the program that principal guest conductor Nicholas Kramer has christened Viva Vivaldi, a concert devoted exclusively to the music of Italian Baroque composer Antonio Vivaldi. Today, Vivaldi is one of the classical composers whose music has made its way into popular culture. The last time I talked about the Four Seasons, for example, I snuck in a clip from the action movie John Wick 3, starring Keanu Reeves. And before that, a comparison with Eddie Van Halen's electric guitar classic, Eruption. Vivaldi's evocative, energetic music pops up in video games, and he has been credited as composer in 13 episodes of the popular cartoon The Simpsons, including in this episode, in which a bit of his winter concerto illustrates a tornado. Homer, you do not have to compete with your friends for me. I would never do that. No! Singing. Fine, but I swear I will win you back from Lenny. NATO! It's like God's vacuum cleaner. <laughs> the fact that Vivaldi's music shows up in so many different places today speaks to just how much it captures listeners' imaginations, I think. But for centuries, his music was completely lost. Vivaldi was revered among his contemporaries, but by the time of his death in 1741, his music had fallen completely out of fashion. And unfortunately, because Vivaldi had stopped his own music from being published so that his 18th century fans wouldn't pirate it, it was even less accessible to later generations. In the 20th century, his music was rediscovered, and the significance of his contributions to classical music were fully recognized. Born in Venice, Antonio Vivaldi was trained in music as a child. He was ordained as a priest in 1703 and became known as the Red Priest as the result of his vocation and his hair, which was apparently quite red. It's hard to tell in the picture we usually see of him, I have to say. The priesthood was not Vivaldi's true calling, and around 1704, he began working at the Ospedale della Pietà, a Venetian school for orphaned, abandoned, illegitimate, and indigent girls specializing in musical training. In addition to room, board, and an excellent education in music, the Pietà offered a creative outlet for women at a time when professional opportunities for female musicians remained uncertain. The students were well respected. According to one scholar, the stars of the Pietà ranked with the foremost virtuosi of their time in the opinion of connoisseurs. They also played many different instruments, as one 18th century writer observed. They played the violin, the recorder, the organ, the oboe, the cello, the bassoon. In fact, there is no instrument large enough to frighten them. Most of Vivaldi's music was written for this institution and for its students. First, I'll talk about the choral music on the program. Vivaldi never set the complete mass as a freestanding work. He did, however, set single sections for the Pietà musicians to perform during church services. This concert features three, the Kyrie, Gloria, and Credo. The Gloria is by far the most famous, and the last time we performed the work, every single musician recorded their part at home during the pandemic and our sound engineer, Christopher Willis, created magic. <laughs>
Gloria is so well known, I'm going to focus more on the Kyrie and Credo. Composed in the 1720s and possibly the latest chronologically of the three choral works, the Kyrie in G minor is written for double chorus and double string orchestra. Vivaldi takes full advantage of the antiphonal possibilities. For example, in the Christe Eleison, Christ Have Mercy, the two choruses constantly trade phrases while the strings chatter underneath. Credo may be the earliest sacred work Vivaldi composed at the Pietà. The text is very long and Vivaldi approaches it almost like an instrumental piece, dividing it into four movements and rushing through the same straightforward simple music for the first section and the last section. All the expressive emphasis is placed on the slow movement, the crucifixus, in which Vivaldi takes great care expressing and was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, suffered death and was buried. Particularly noteworthy are the chromatic descents and ascents at the words passus et sepultus est, suffered death and was buried, which literally depict the act of burial and allude to Christ's resurrection. I'm going to play a bit of the opening credo and then segue into the crucifixus. In addition to music used during the liturgy, 
Vivaldi composed quasi-sacred music for specific functions at the orphanage. Around 1730, he wrote two works bearing the subtitle Al Santo Sepulcro, or At the Holy Grave, a sonata in the Symphonia in B minor. Both consist of two movements and may have been intended for a service in the Pietà Chapel between Maundy Thursday and Holy Saturday, the Thursday and Saturday before Easter. Despite the symphonia's brevity, its chromatic intensity, dramatic fervor, and distinct lack of virtuosity perfectly illustrate Vivaldi's expressive side. Of course, much of what Baldi composed were works specifically for the Pietà students. He ended up writing hundreds of concertos, music for orchestra and soloist, or groups of soloists, to show off the skills of the performers. The concerto genre went hand in hand with the 18th century's growing fascination with virtuoso playing generally, not to mention Vivaldi's own skill. An extremely accomplished violinist, Vivaldi made a big impression on his audiences. A witness at one of his performances remarked, he added a cadenza that really frightened me, for such playing has not been heard before and can never be equaled. He brought his fingers no more than a straw's breadth from the bridge, leaving no room for the bow, and that on all four strings with imitations and incredible speed. The Concerto for Three Violins in F major is a great example of Vivaldi's innovative approach to the concerto. Even though his instrumental resources might seem relatively homogenous, it's a string orchestra and a group of three violins, he finds new ways constantly for the soloist to interact, while the orchestra's reliable returns provide a solid ground. <laughs> Vivaldi maintained ties to the Pietà throughout his life, but eventually he had enough security to travel without worrying about losing his job. 
Around 1730, he journeyed to Central Europe where his operas were being performed in Vienna and Prague. While he was there, he composed one of the few concertos for instruments that we know was not written for his students in Venice, the Concerto for Lute in D major, dedicated to Bohemian music connoisseur, royal governor, and head of the court judiciary, Count Johann Josef von Wirtby. In the first and third movements, orchestral ritornelli, or returns, and a vigorous bass line anchor the brilliant plucked solo part. The mesmerizing second movement showcases the instrument's meditative beauty, while the strings provide a shimmering background of quiet lyricism. Having the opportunity to consider several facets of Vivaldi's musical personality at the same time, his choral music, his instrumental concertos, and a bit of music he wrote to fulfill a specific function, gave me a more well-rounded idea of who he was as an artist. He experienced religious texts passionately, yet could be a little impatient when it came to expressing the nuance of individual words. This stands in direct contrast to Box Magnificat, which we heard in September. When it came to writing for instruments alone, however, he never seemed to tire. And there is no doubt that he had infinite respect for the skilled musicians at the Pieta for whom he was writing. This program also offers a chance to contemplate what happens when talent that might otherwise have lain dormant is nurtured and given time and space to grow. I hope you'll join me in November for Windy City, a program Dame Jane Glover put together featuring Mozart's fourth horn concerto, which I love, Hummel's bassoon concerto, Handel's water music, and more. It's going to be a lot of fun, and I think that you probably can guess why she gave it that name. You'll find all the details at baroque.org forward slash Windy. Thank you so much. Thank you.